Hello, I'm Patrick Lindsay with Ridgeline Guiding and today I wanted to share with you a little bit about what I put in my pack when I'm going ice climbing, whether personally or professionally as an ACMG Alpine Guide. So what I like to do is start from the top down and work my way down and think about my systems that I'm going to need for that day. And we're going to be assuming that it's a single day that we're going out climbing um, and it can be anywhere from you know some local spots, whether it be the junkyards or to maybe some bigger routes like say Polar Circus, for example. So when I start from my head down check, of course, it always starts with your helmet. So that's pretty basic. Everyone will have a climbing helmet of sorts. I won't get into too, too much detail about that. Uh, your day might start early or end early or something might happen. So of course, you also want to have your headlamp. Uh, make sure the batteries are charged before you head out. Um, something that definitely becomes important around the winters up here because our days do get a little bit shorter. Um, of course, you also want to have a toque of sorts to keep your head warm. Um, in addition on, to, on your face, you want to have some things like maybe some sunglasses. Um, <clears throat> and in addition to maybe some sunglasses, I don't always use sunscreen in the winter, but sometimes, especially if you're on a solar facing route, um, catching a lot of sun that day, a lot of albedo effect off the snow, you might be thinking about also packing some sunscreen. Moving down from there, um, it goes to basically my mouth. So what am I going to eat and drink during the day? A lot of that will depend on, you know, how big the day is going to be, um, how much time I might have to eat, things like that. But generally I have kind of my typical thing, which I'll bring. So over here, uh, I'll quite often bring two small thermoses. Uh, this one's really nice on a multi-pitch climbing because it's really quick and easy to open, drink, close, and not spill. Some of the tricks with these is to make sure they don't spill in your pack, so they don't accidentally open. So finding a good one um, that doesn't open and, and get all of your other gear wet is important. Um, another one that I like to bring, and this one's definitely a lot more secure, is your standard thermos with the lid that screws off, you pour, you sip, stuff like that. Now, I've been climbing in the Rockies for a while and I, I love my sandwiches, um, but in the winter, sometimes they can get a little bit too chilly. I like some to warm up. So I actually uh, quite often will bring a thermos um, with, so I can put in quite often leftover food from the night before. Um, with that, don't forget, bring a plastic spoon. It's lighter and it doesn't stick to your tongue or lips in the cold. Um, in addition to that, you know, typically have maybe about four bars. Um, if I want to have a bigger day, I might up the bar count. I might also toss in some other things like some, a pepperoni or some sort of meat stick and some cheese or something like that. Um, fruits are sometimes good too, um, but uh, I tend to eat a little bit more fruits either before I go out climbing uh, or more summer trips, things like that. Sometimes they can definitely freeze in the winter. Um, moving, moving down from there, um, I'll sometimes bring a neck warmer. Uh, it's also great if you're going to be going somewhere, you might have some high winds, uh, to help protect your, your face and skin. Um, in addition to that, you could also use it if there's a lot of sun that day and which you definitely would use a bit more in the summertime for summer mountaineering. <clears throat> and you'll see me look down a little bit here. I have this little uh, quick checklist that I go through all the time. And I basically go down this checklist and these are all the things that I want to consider for my day of climbing. And I have them sort of ordered top down as I work my way down through my system. Um, so what we have next coming on is our layering system. So what we're gonna wear for our clothes. So for me, typically I max out at about eight layers on the top and four layers on the bottom. Now that does sound a bit ridiculous in terms of a lot of layers but when i break it down it, it will make a bit more sense and when you are layering um, the strategy behind that is uh, you're using a bunch of this insulating material and all the little air layers in between to help keep you warm and, and reduce the uh, amount of your body heat that is you know transmitted to the environment um, so a good pair of underwear something that you know is stretchy quick drying something like that um, I'll often rock a pair of, uh, some long underwear or long johns, you might call them. These are some of Patagonia's, uh, some thicker ones that they have. 
Next to that, something like some ski socks are also pretty good. Uh, or you can get some lower cut down the ankle socks. Uh, I typically don't rock two socks, um, but you could. So I find sometimes it just sort of bulks out your foot and you have to be careful because if your foot gets too tight, then you might start to get cold feet. Um, coming back up a little bit, um, the nice, you know, quick drying, stretchy t-shirt. Um, and this is one of the things that I'll, I'll add a little bit more um, detail to is, so here's my long sleeve uh, sort of collared shirt. And the one thing that's nice about it is that it's a V-neck. It can be a V-neck if I keep my the zipper down. And what I like about that is when I'm multi-pitch climbing and say you put your gloves in your coat, I'll clip my gloves together and then I'll put one on the inner side of this shirt and one on the outer side. That way, when you're climbing, if you have coat uh, gloves within your coat, your gloves can't fall out through the bottom of your jacket and fall down the pitch. Well, that's, a, that's a good little trick. In addition to that, I'll quite often have um, sort of a light to medium weight vest, which is great to kind of um, regulate your layers depending on what's going on. Um, in addition to that, I'll quite often have, this is basically a, a thin soft shell, which I'll put over top of, uh, of all those layers. Something that I can, you know, be quite aerobic with. I can shed heat on approaches. Um, that'll also shed a little bit of water and a, and a bit of snow. Won't absorb too much. Uh, cut a little bit of the wind. But it's not my hard outer layer like my hard shell, which you'll see in a sec. Um, then, of course, don't forget your, your climbing pants. So, something that ideally climbing specific because the companies do a pretty good job with that. You know, some nice pockets on the side, easy access, something where it's stretchy, quick drying. Also has a little bit of insulation. You can see these ones have a bit of a fleecy material on the inside. <clears throat> so that's kind of some of your, my main layers that I'll be working with. But if the weather starts to maybe get a little bit more dicey weather, you know, it's the, the ice route is is uh, dripping lots of water. It's really windy. It's really snowy. Um, things can get pretty cold. And one thing I really you want to do is you want to dress really warm in here. This is kind of like your your chest is like the heat generator. It's kind of like the core, right? And if your fingers and stuff are cold, typically it's you're losing maybe too much heat here. And by the time it gets to your fingers, you know that heat has sort of dissipated, has exchanged through your arm and other places and your fingers are feeling the result. Same thing with your toes. So I find a lot of climbers in the winter, they don't actually dress warm enough in their legs. Our legs are big, they hold lots of blood, they are not sensitive, and because of that, we tend not to dress them as heavily as, as maybe we should. And, and due to that, our feet tend to be pretty chilly. Um, so to combat that, you know, you want to make sure this is warm, but also you're dressing warm here. So quite a lot, you know, um, on my legs, I'll actually wear my hard shell pants. And that stops the wind from stripping heat off my legs. In addition to that, it also kind of holds some of my moisture and heat within, kind of acts as a little bit of a barrier. You do have to be careful with that because if your layering system is too heavy, you'll start sweating, which you want to kind of avoid sweating up here when with these really cold winters. <clears throat> because one, you're typically not bringing too much water, and two, you're kind of, you know, dehydrating yourself, which could co complicate things down the, down the road. So for my hard shell pants, you know, that'll be kind of my third layer that I'll have on my legs. And if it's really cold, uh, where did I put them? I think they're back here. <clears throat> And if it's really cold, sometimes I'll actually put uh, an, some, an insulated pair of pants, some either belay pants or something of this sort, uh, underneath my hard shell and climb with that on really cold days. Or when I'm at the crag, um, belaying friends or, or clients, I'll toss these on over my pants so when I'm standing around and not moving as much, 
um, my feet stay warmer and I'll really pay attention to how warm my feet are. And if they start to feel, you know, really cold to the point where I'm losing sensation, they feel a little blocky, then you have to look towards warming your feet up. And that could be anything from going for a quick little aerobic run, doing some squats, jumping jacks, push-ups, or adding some layers. And then a couple more layers on the upper, which I might have. So this is my hard shell jacket. So your waterproof, sort of windproof layer, or as best as it can be without going to straight rubber. Uh, something that fits underneath your harness that works well, isn't restricting. And then next to that, I'll have a few more sort of some warm layers. And so this is a bit of a, a mid, uh, this is your um, Arc'teryx Atom LT. So a nice sort of mid layer, nice and breathable, which adds a little bit of uh, some extra warmth if I need it. Um, but when things are really cold or when you're belaying, um, it's nice to have these big down jackets around here to really stay, stay warm with. And the only addition to that is when I show up at the parking spot, my bag's pretty much ready. And that big coat is typically near the bottom of my, pet, of my backpack. So what I'll often have is a car park or something that I can toss on while we're getting ready in the day or in the morning. And then just before we leave the car, I take it off and I'm in some uh, layers where, that are more appropriate for me to, you know, exert some, exert some energy and start hiking towards the crag or wherever you're going. And so that might be something a little more in, in line with this. I think this is their Atom AR, roughly they call it now. Arc'teryx Atom AR, just a little bit thicker than that black jacket I previously showed. So that basically covers us down to here and our clothing layers. Next, we'll be looking, going down our, our arms. So it gets to you a big question on gloves. So what do you want to bring? So quite often you'll want a, at least one thick warm pair that is good for belaying with. So that'd be something like, like these guys here. Uh, on cold days, you kind of could climb with them, but if you, the better you do regulating your temperature here and keeping your hands warm, you can get away with a little bit thinner, more dexterous pair of gloves. Um, these are some black diamond punishers. I've gone through many pairs of these. They're great. They have some nice padding, which is really good uh, for the climbing gloves. They're pretty dexterous, um, but they're, they do wear out, but this isn't a gear review. So it's, it's just a medium pair of climbing gloves. Um, something along the lines, climbers are definitely rocking these a lot lately. They're basically these, uh, you know, fisherman type gloves. They're waterproof until they actually break down and get cracks and stuff in there. But when you're climbing up and the glove is on, you put your cuff of your sleeve will be in here and water tends to shed over, cascade over the glove and your hands stay dry. They're also really good for alpine climbing and stuff in the summer uh, when it's really windy or uh, rainy, sorry. Um, also on approaches or other times you're gonna be playing in the snow a lot and touching the snow because other gloves say like these ones, for example, the more you touch the snow, the more they get saturated, then you basically gotta, once they get wet and freeze, they're useless and you have to toss them in your pack. But these ones are nice because they, as long as snow and water doesn't get in here, then your hands can actually stay pretty dry and the gloves stay dry and stay useful for quite a long time. Now for working, working ropes, uh, whether you're repelling um, or say if it's a warmer day and you're belaying, um, it's good to have something that's not too expensive, a leather pair of gloves that you can kind of get beat up, that can get beat up when you're repelling for as a, as a quick example. And um, they can get the holes instead of your bit more expensive climbing gloves. So, and next to that, I might also bring, say if um, it's maybe a bit of a warmer day or a harder pitch and I'm doing a really good job keeping my core warm and my hands warm, then you can actually get into some thinner pairs of gloves, climb with. Um, your thinner gloves will help sort of uh, fend off the pump as you don't have to grip as hard on the tool. They're just a little bit more ergonomic. Next to that, moving down, staying with our hands, of course, you need your ice tools. Um, and depending on your approach, you might also want a hiking pole. One or two, 
depending on what you like. I tend to quite often at least bring one. Um, I typically only go to two when I have a big pack and a, and a big day, something like on Mount Robson or something like that. <clears throat> now, moving down this way, then you start to get to your harness. So here's my harness. Um, you have your ice clippers on it. Um, I tend to rock about three. If I have a, if I'm going to do big roots, hard roots where I carry more screws, then I'll typically rock four of these ice clippers. In addition to that, you will have my prusik for repelling with. I might also have a quick little quick link with me. And then also on your harness, you're basically going to be thinking about, um, your climbing gear. So what are you going to bring for your climbing gear? So you get asked a lot, you know, what, what do I bring or what do other people bring for, you know, what's a standard climbing rack? Um, each person might have their opinion. Um, <clears throat> for multi-pitch climbing, I'd say probably starts at about 12 screws, plus or minus, you know, four screws or something like that. So if you're doing big, long pitches, 70 meter pitches, you might want somewhere up to say 16 screws. If you're doing something really easy, maybe it has um, bolted belays, you could probably get down to easily maybe eight screws or something like that. Um, a lot of my leading screws will be 13s. You'll often always bring, you know, your long 22 with you and some of these 16s also for anchors. And maybe if uh, you kind of wanted that extra security of a longer screw somewhere in the pitch. Um, say if I have 12 screws, two for each anchor roughly, that's probably at a minimum, I'm gonna want about eight quick draws. Most of the time I'll rock just straight quick draws just with an easy dog bone. But for some routes, I'll quite often uh, sort of bring just maybe one or two alpine draws, uh, unless the route's going to be really waving around and gear is going to be all over the place. But most of the time, these longer alpine draws are meant more for alpine climbing and trad climbing. Um, but they just give me a few extra options, so I don't mind bringing these two. They don't weigh much more. <clears throat> Next to that, um, I'll quite often, these are my little anchor kits. So uh, these are 120 sewn slings. I might also bring a 240 if I wanted to be doing some quad anchors, something like that. Um, I'll bring a couple chunks of cordelette. So both of these are about five meters in length. This is a seven mil, this is a six. This six is a tech cord, so it's actually about as strong as your climbing rope. You'll bring, of course, your V-thread hooker, some cord to potentially leave behind, though nowadays we use a lot more naked threads, a uh, knife to cut with. I'll quite often have five, at least five locking carabiners. If I have two guests or, you know, other things are going on, I might have more, but at a minimum, I typically bring five. So you have your belay device, um, two for that if you're going to do direct anchor belays, and then three more for whatever you need for. Um, and the reason for this cord and the extra uh, lockers is with what I've learned with my rescue systems, that's the minimum of what I need. Um, now, in addition, there's something special that might go here, depending on your route, and that you definitely want to consider. And that's your avalanche transceiver. So are you in avalanche terrain? You know, is there a hazard of avalanches coming and hitting you? Something like that. So that's a big discussion for another day, but it's definitely a piece of equipment that you want to consider. So here, you know, I have my avalanche transceiver that would get worn over the head and shoulder on your chest or wherever else the manufacturer might rec uh, allow. Um, your shovel clipped together and your pro avalanche probe. <clears throat> Um, a couple other things you might want to consider um, as you kind of keep moving down the system um, are gaiters. So is it, are you going to be tra uh, tromping through deep snow? Is that snow potentially getting into your boots? You'll see me, um, the boots that I tend to wear a lot uh, lately, um, kind of have a built-in gaiter with them. So I haven't been bringing gaiters along as much these days, but definitely it's a piece of equipment that I'll consider. Um, which then, of course, brings you down to your boots. You have, you know, a good pair of, of uh, waterfall ice climbing boots that are comfortable and fit well and all that stuff. On cold days, 
typically once it hits about minus 20 for me, I'm looking to either add, make sure I add more layers on my upper to get away with the boot, like those Phantom Techs, which aren't too warm. Or I'll be looking to go to a warmer pair of boots, something like a double pair. So on cold days, um, I'll be rocking these La Sportiva uh, Spantix. Um, they're a pretty good boot. I do get a little pinching in here. Um, and another popular pair of boot is the, the Phantom uh, 6000s by Scarpa. And there's definitely others on the market. Um, moving down from there, of course, you need your crampons. So crampons, pretty. if you're watching this video, it should be pretty self-explanatory. You don't want any, a glacial pair of crampons. You want something for waterfall ice. So these are these new ones that I'm trying out recently, and I've actually been pretty happy with them, the Black Diamond uh, Snaggletooths. Um, so they're a one and a half point in the front and instead of a vertical front point, they're a horizontal front point. So they're, they're pretty good in some, you know, more, more mushy ice or more sort of featured ice. That's, uh, maybe a little bit more chandelier, things like that. Um, and then moving on from there, you're starting to look a bit more in terms of some group gear. So what kind of rope are you going to bring? Are you going to bring some double ropes, a single, uh, rope? Um, is it a walk off? Is it a rappel? You know, those are considerations for your specific route that you're going on. Um, but other things you definitely want to be looking to bring are your own, your, your first aid kit. So in here, I'll have a few, some over the counter meds, some bandaged material, some tape, some splinting, um, sort of slings and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, I actually also have this sort of like, that first aid kit typically doesn't get used very much, so it goes in the bottom of, of my pack. But I might stumble across an accident or need quick access to my first aid kit. So I have a very tiny first aid kit that sits higher in my pack. And that'll have some tape, a couple small bandages, um, a face mask, and some gloves. Just some quick access things that if I think if I ever quickly needed to get in there, um, I wouldn't have to start digging into my bag. I have some quick access. be your tarp um for you know if someone was to get hurt or to um uh, that that person who got hurt to sort of shelter them from the environments or to shelter yourself from the environments maybe something came in like a say you're alpine climbing and uh, a rainstorm or a snowstorm just quickly came in and you just want to cover yourself and just wait it out you will also like to have in this bag, you know, I'll have some toilet paper and a lighter. I'll also have um, a little bit of a repair kit. So whether my um, whether my um, ice axe, maybe the front picks or something like that come loose, I'll have some of those Allen keys in there to tighten those. Um, same with any specific tools I might need for my crampons um, and things of that nature. Maybe a, um, a little clip for a buckle for like your backpack or a little patch to repair a hole so say if you got a hole in your uh, down jacket you can patch that quickly and then you're not losing feathers all over the place um, probably also uh, a shoelace in here in case you blow a shoelace on your boot and moving on with that some other group gear in here is my guide radio um, which I can use to talk to other guides um, and potentially call for a rescue if needed but more importantly than that um, I also have this satellite communication device because the radio is not good everywhere. So something like this, it's really small, it's really light. This is your inReach mini device. It's basically, you know, uh, you know, hit the SOS button, alert the authorities. Hopefully, you know, the cavalry will come in and, and rescue you. Um, but what I also really use it for is before I leave the day, I'll make a plan um, and I'll typically tell my wife, where I'm going, when I'm going to be back, all the sort of stuff that you're supposed to do and is and you should do. Um, but if say I'm going to be late, and and you know if I'm if I am late, then what she does is she'll get on the phone and contact you know whatever authorities she needs to and say, hey, my husband is overdue. This is where he is. Yada yada. Um, she doesn't have to worry. So I'll get a hold of her and say, and basically I'll pair this with my phone, send her a text message via this, which goes through the satellite systems uh, to her. And we'll let her know my new ETA, you know, give her a thumbs up that everything is good. 
you know, expect me to reach out to you again in an hour or two or something like that. Now we're getting into some of the other details here, which, uh, you know, are your face masks um, and some extra face masks if needed, as well as some hand sanitizer. So nowadays we're getting out and you know, COVID is, is definitely out there and we need to additionally protect ourselves. So we want to make sure that we have our face masks. So whenever on any trips or courses that we're doing, um, we employ a greater than two meter gap social distance between us all outside. Now, if at any times we need to get maybe a bit closer than that, um, everyone would don their face mask. Um, so next to that, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of the the gear list a um, couple other things that you might want to consider potentially bringing um, bear spray so right right now it's you know early January you won't be expecting too many bears but you could run into some it has happened um, I wouldn't I typically won't bring bear spray this late in the winter but early winter you know bears are still kind of roaming around and they were roaming around you know decently late into December this year. Um, it's not a bad idea to bring some bear spray. At least think about it and make a call whether it's appropriate or not. Uh, we talked about some sunscreen. Um, and then, you know, depending on what you have for your gear and tape and other improvised splinting materials, uh, it's also not a bad idea to consider actually bringing a specific splinting device, say like this Sam splint here. Now, all of that needs to go in your bag. So what kind of backpack are you going to be bringing? For myself, I'll quite often be using this sort of 45 liter bag. It's pretty good. Crampons can go on, out on the outside, um, which saves a lot of room on the inside. It's a pretty tight bag. I won't be getting my rope in here if I have one. I won't be getting my crampons probably in here. Um, it'll be pretty full by the end. You have to be pretty strategic also when unpacking it. Um, so I'd recommend sort of in the winter, somewhere in that 45 to 50 liter range. In addition to that, you might also be thinking about potentially bringing a bullet bag. So say for example, you get to, you get to a route, um, say like Moonlight in Evan Thomas Creek, and you want to bring maybe so, a little bit of some of your warm drinks, maybe a, maybe a bar or two. Also bring your, your warm jacket and your communication device and maybe like your uh, quick mini first aid kit, which mostly would probably involve just some tape. That stuff could go in this bullet bag. So then this is your nice, small, nimble climbing bag and your bigger bag with other things that you may or may not really need can stay down on the bottom, for example. So yeah, that, uh, that mostly wraps up um, all the gear that I'm thinking about bringing or not bringing. If uh, next, I think I'll probably do a little video on how it all goes into my pack and how I think about packing this sort of stuff. Um, but that's that's about it. Um, if you have any sort of unique pieces of gear that you bring, or maybe something that I forgot, which definitely could have happened here, um, feel free to comment, send me a message. Um, I'm always really eager to talk to people of the of the public and hear your opinions and and provide sort of some bit of mentoring that I can when I can here and there. So um, thank you for watching um, and have a great rest of the year 2021.